There we go. Okay, great. Uh, so welcome, everybody, and thanks uh, for joining us uh, in this really hot day. We appreciate uh, you being here with us. Uh, today, we are very happy to, I'm very happy to uh, host uh, Dwight Kravitz um, from George Washington University, um, who I've already had a really interesting discussion prior to the talk with, and I'm really looking forward to this um, talk. I think it's going to be really relevant to many different parts of the wind community. Um, so actually, just without um, talking too much, I'll just quickly remind you of uh, the control features of Crowdcast. Um, if uh, on your right, there's a chat where you can ask clarification questions um, or express anything you want to express. Um, I'll be monitoring that. Um, and if there are any clarification questions, uh, burning, burning questions, I will refer them to Dwight. And uh, if there, uh, you have any deeper questions or questions for the end of the talk, please use the ask a question button at the end, at the bottom of the screen. Um, and please indicate if you would like or not to be invited to the screen to ask your question at the end of the talk. If not, I can um, ask the question for you. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, Dwight, the floor is yours, and thanks very much uh, for for coming today. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me and for coordinating all of this, and uh, thanks everyone for attending as well. Um, so this is going to be slightly strange because I'm sort of talking at a screen that displays only my slides, but I will pause periodically for clarification questions, um, and we'll proceed from here. So what I wanted to do uh, today and what I decided to do was something a little bit different than the standard talk I usually give because uh, the group has really got a fair amount of expertise in, in fMRI and a broad array of interests. And so rather than doing a really deep dive into one line of my research, I decided to kind of try to pull it together um, around a theoretical idea. Uh, and what I'm going to do is kind of argue, uh, first off, uh, that the sort of localization that fMRI provides us um, has to be considered really deeply in order to understand its implications for cognitive mechanism. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is go through a couple of results and thought and thought experiments that kind of lay out where the limitations and strengths of that of this general fMRI approach have come have come to kind of show show themselves. Uh, and then I'm going to go through a couple of examples of how we can use the observations that come from the physiology to really make novel and highly specific predictions about behavior and to inform the design initially of future experiments and then ultimately uh, working our way back to the original cognitive intuitions that gave rise to the first round of experiments that we ran regardless. And so what I'm going to try to present to you is in essence, a broad survey of a bunch of work that I've done over my career, all of which fits into this general idea of using physiology uh, to drive our understanding of behavior. All right, so um, to begin, I'm gonna just sort of give a broad overview of uh, vision as we kind of think, think about it. Um, this is uh, the original uh, schematic, of, this is a schematic of the original result that defined the dorsal and ventral, and ventral pathways. Um, and what it really comes down to is when you lesion, oh, let me do one thing. Uh, when you lesion a portion of the parietal cortex, you get deficits in spatial learning tasks where monkeys will no longer recognize, right, that the food well closer to this object uh, is the one which contains the food. And if you lesion bits of the inferior temporal cortex, right, you get deficits not in spatial learning, but deficits then in pattern rec recognition. And this leads to this bifurcation, right, into the where and what path pathways that, in essence, undergirds a great deal still of the um, non-human primate work and the human vision vision work as as well. Okay, um, and it leads to a couple of really intuitive results and metaphors, right, for how the system functions. So if we look in detail, say, at the, at the ventral visual path pathway, we see a sequence of visual areas now known to contain um, maps of the, visual, of the visual world. As we go from the most posterior areas where input is coming in to the more anterior, right, the latency of the, of the onset of the first spike gets, gets longer and longer and longer. The size of the receptive fields increases increases slightly. If you then go ahead and instantiate um, these general principles into computational models, 
Uh, this is a schematic of one of the architectures of, H, of HMAX, but even the, the underlying architectures of the current deep, deep belief for CNN or DNN models um, really draw from this idea, right, of a staged hierarchy where information processing is getting more complex as you work your way from early visual input through to later representation. Right. That notion, um, you know, has proved to be computationally powerful. It's very does a very good job of organizing the results of the uh, non-human primate literature, but there is an oddity that comes about when we start to consider uh, the human fMRI literature. Right, and you know, there are of course many oddities. The one I'm going to highlight here is the uh, stereotypical structure of category selectivity. Right, so. Uh, beginning with Nancy Canwisher's sort of seminal paper, right, a series of areas have now been described. This is, of course, a non-exhaustive schematic of them, right, where individual areas show selectivity, right, for one class of visual object over another, right? And moreover, those areas occur in a very stereotypical pattern, right, where across individuals, the vast majority of individuals will evidence having the area, and moreover, they'll evidence having it in the same place. Right? And that uh, leads to a bit of a problem, right? If there is this stereotypical structure and it's organized not around, say, low-level visual statistics, but around visual category, um, then we can begin to question, or people began to question, the utility, right, of this overall framework of the dorsal versus ventral pathway. Maybe the story that the fMRI is telling, and this is a screen grab from a paper by Dahan and Alan, Alan Cowie. Um, maybe the, the story that the fMRI is telling is that once we get beyond basic vision, what we really have is a set of distinct and only loosely connected modules, right? Each one of which is gonna be responsible for dealing with one aspect of the visual world and will have denser connections, right? Between other things that share its selectivity than between things that don't. Right? In this sense, there's nothing to be gained really by considering um, there to be separable or organized pathways for vision if in fact once we move beyond basic vision, we immediately move into an architecture that looks much more like our sort of cognitive accounts of the world. Right? But this is a problem. Okay? It's not actually a strength of the fMRI literature. This interpretation isolates the fMRI literature from the primate work. Right? There is no way now to tie these things back together. Um, it also opens up an endless quest for describing the next set of areas. Right, So if you think that, in fact, this system is organized around, let's say, even biologically relevant categories, right, then all you have to do is think of another category that might be represented in some module in the brain, run the experiment, localize activation or information for that category, and then describe it. And we end up with a sort of list of these areas, right, but no real way of associating things together and no really good way of making connection with the overall story of the sort of staged hierarchy that came out of the older phys physiological work. Um, and so this mismatch, right, is something that I think we have to resolve. And this is gonna be the first, the first argument I'm gonna make is that it can be resolved and that in doing so, the localization that we get out of the fMRI um, can be shown to converge with aspects of the underlying physiology that have, that have been described. And moreover, that because of that convergence, the localization that we see in fMRI acquires greater meaning, right? It means that it, it's predictable. It means that it arises from dynamics, right, that occur in observations outside of the technique of fMRI. And hopefully that helps us to stitch the um, field together, together better. So our first clue of the problem with this account of these sort of separable specialized modules is that there is a such thing as the visual word form area, right? This is an area of the brain that appears to be, um, appears to meet all of the criteria, right, for category select selectivity. It occurs in a consistent location across individuals. Um, when an area, when an area, areas in and around it are lesioned, you get a deficit, which is associated with it. Um, the in the inability to read. Um, and there's no way that this thing is actually some sort of an evolved module that's been placed in the brain, right? At least on this side of the Atlantic, literacy is perhaps not as old. 
Um, and it seems unlikely, right, that evolution has had a chance to build a specialized module and place it somewhere, right? So in fact, you can get this stereotypical location, right, and a sort of specialization of function within these particular areas without it being the result of an arbitrary evolutionary event, right? This selectivity, in other words, has to emerge from some sort of a learned or acquired um, skill. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is revisit the neuroanatomy of the dorsal and ventral streams um, in the context now of about 30 to 40 years of anatomical tracer work. And here I really have to highlight the contributions of Kathar Bacha Salim, who is an absolutely encyclopedic um, has an absolutely encyclopedic knowledge of all of the neuroanatomy in the monkey. And this is gonna, this is gonna be a brief overview of some work that I did in collaboration with him, Mort Mishkin, Leslie Ungerleiter, and Chris, and Chris Baker. Um, and of course, as soon as you look in detail at what the connectivity actually looks like, you see that it's not just a simple single arrow that proceeds from uh, v, V1 down the surface of the, temp the temporal lobe. In fact, there's a great deal of structure, right? There's some, there are some connections which will leap between inter intermediate stages. You can see things like that here. Um, you can see by the thickness of these arrows that the strength of the connectivity that's been observed also varies in uh, the monkey. And then you can also see, uh, oh, I should also mention, all of these arrows are uh, unidirectional, but they are actually all bidirectional connections as well. And so rather than just having a sequence of stages that sort of uh, linearly proceed down the length of the, the temporal lobe, what we see is an integrated circuit, right? That has a lot of variation in its, in its structure. And what I'm gonna argue is that that variation in its, in its structure can be used to predict uh, the structure of the functional response that we observe in fMRI. Um, and then as soon as we sort of come to grips with the complexity within the ventral visual pathway in and of itself, we can then immediately shift over and look at the set of connections that emerge from it. And we see, again, similar levels of complexity, integration with systems in the medial temporal lobe responsible for memory, complex spatial processing, integration with uh, systems in the orbital frontal and medial pre prefrontal responsible for things like reward, and then also connections that go into the lateral prefrontal as well potentially for directing things like working memory and, and attention, right? So all of these, this circuitry, right, is going to create the opportunity for the formation of representations which are relevant to ongoing behavior, right? The structure that we observe within this circuit in the functional response in fMRI is gonna be shaped by the feedback coming from these higher level systems that track things like reward, um, long-term memory, emotionally relevant stimuli, so forth and so on. Okay, um, what this means is the models that we build, which are based on the intuition of the staged hierarchy, are really models of computational principles, right? What can be accomplished with a hierarchy, right, that has a series of placed or learned nonlinearities between the various levels, okay? They are not, however, a model of the underlying structure of the actual brain, right? And that distinction is gonna turn out to be important um, because it means that the models have a utility, right? In understanding the power of a computational principle, but unless they capture the appropriate structure of the neuroanatomy, they're not gonna really help us to anticipate um, the location, right? The, the actual details of how primate vision works. Okay, so what I'm gonna argue is that this neuroanatomy provides the skeleton over which selectivity is built, right? In that it defines the areas of the cortex which have access to the information necessary for generating adaptive behavior. And if you are uh, called upon to generate that behavior repeatedly, then over time, the circuitry here is gonna shape itself such that you get patches of neurons which are responsible for dealing with these categories or tasks or processes that you're repeatedly doing that are gonna occur in locations that are gonna be defined by where the information is available to actually make that behavior work. Okay, so I'm gonna give you then a specific example in the domain of scene processing 
And then I think I will pause quickly for clarification in case there are any, which I, again, cannot see if anyone is typing anything at all. So let's consider scenes, right? Scenes are a really interesting category of thing because they contain within them a huge amount of different forms of information, right? So when you look at a scene like this, which is actually a really nice hotel room um, in New York City, there's Central Park West outside, right? You can look at this, this scene and you can parse it in terms of a bunch of different aspects, right? So could it be that you're interested, say, in the objects, right? Or that there is an area of the brain that is particularly sensitive to the presence of certain objects, right? In which case the response to the scene will be defined by whether those objects are present or not, right? It could also be category, right? I've told you that this is a, a hotel room, which you could maybe derive from how well staged it is, um, but you would also say this is an indoor space, this is an apartment, you can tell that you're a fair amount off the ground. And so whatever the aspects are that define the category of scene could be the things that drive the response of an area as well. Um, and then you have the spatial aspects, right? How navigable is this is the scene? Um, estimates of how far away various objects are, right? The meat that actually allows you to take effective action uh, within the scene is another aspect that might be driving a response to this uh, stimulus. And then you also have the advantage that scenes are incredibly hetero heterogeneous, right? They're very different from each other, all right? And that means that we have a stimulus domain where there's a huge amount of possible things that you can display and a huge amount of possible aspects within each one of the stimuli that could be driving the overall level of response. What we want to be able to do is anticipate, right, what aspect of the scene an area is going to be sensitive to on the basis of its connectivity. So we're going to take the sort of classic area here, which is the parahippocampal place area. Um, this is an area that's typically defined in a contrast of, say, scenes versus faces or objects or scrambled, whatever it is. In this particular case for the data shown here on the right, um, this is a contrast of scenes versus faces. The faces are in red. The scenes are coming through in blue. Um, this is seven Tesla data, the raw EPI images. And so you can see that the PPA is this area here. It's sort of medial to the activation that we get for faces. It's in the parahippocampal gyrus, hence its name. So we're gonna ask the question, can we anticipate or predict what aspect of scenes drives PPA's response um, in the context of its neuroanatomy, the connections which it, which it has. So we're gonna have to work our way back to the monkey for the detailed neuroanatomy, at least initially, um, and look at the regions which are gonna be homo homologous. If we look down at the sort of equivalent structure here in the monkey, we see that it's this area down here, TFO and TFTH, right? It gets its primary input from the ventral visual pathway via uh, V4V, and in particular, via the portions of the retinotopic map in V4V, uh, which are peripheral, right? So it's getting most of its, of its input from the peripheral portions of the visual world, okay? Um, and you can see that reflected a little bit in the human fMRI data. Uh, this is actually a plot of an, old, of an old result from Rafi Malik's lab, where he looked at um, eccentricity and then simply saw um, you know, how, those, how the banding of eccentricity related ultimately to the category selectivity. And you can see here along the medial inferior surface of the temporal lobe that you get a strong representation of the peripheral portions of space. Okay. Um, there is also a set of descending connectivity coming into these same areas from the parietal cortex. Uh, this is the parietal mediotemporal path, pathway that we described in our uh, review of the, dorsal, of the dorsal stream. You can see that it's a really complex and, in fact, evolutionarily ancient path, pathway. A homologous structure is present in rodent, um, which is going to uh, send spatial inf in information from the, from the parietal cortex down into TFO, TFTH, um, which is going to, uh, in turn, be deeply interconnected with the hippocampus as well. Okay, we can see hints that the same pattern of connectivity exists in the human. Uh, this is from a paper using functional connectivity, where they were identifying connections between areas in the medial parietal. And you can see here in blue the connection between the, I, the IPL, uh, the retrosplenial cortex, and then on into uh, the structures where the PPA is, lo is located. Okay, so how are we going to query then? So we have then a firm prediction. Right? Definitely, we think that the PPA should be responding to the spatial aspects of scenes, 
because it's getting most of its input from uh, the peripheral portions of the visual world, and it's getting input from the parietal cortex as well, which we know um, is spatially selective. But what we want to do is design an experiment that's going to reveal that structure in a data in a data driven way. And so here we ran um, a relatively simple simple multi multi multivariate study uh, where we presented 96 individual scenes that were. Uh, sort of organized in terms of a bunch of different factors at once. So they were picked based on their category, based on, you know, for example, here you have a bunch of churches, right? Here are small churches, here are larger churches, right? You have a division between indoor and, and outdoor scenes, um, scenes which have sort of strong spatial constraints like canyons and forests versus scenes that don't. And so you can see there's a bunch of different factors here, as will always be the case when you present stimuli this complex. But what we can do is present all of those stimuli individually, localize the PPA, and look at its multivariate response to see how similarly it treats every stimulus. And when we do that, we can reconstruct that similarity space in a multidimensional scaling plot. And because every condition is in fact one image, we can pull this trick where we display the images directly. And some of you are, I'm sure, already beginning to see what the primary division in this structure actually is. You can see it a little bit more easily if we go to a more symbolic representation. So here's the same structure, but now I've colored these scenes by whether they are predominantly man-made or natural. You can see there's not a great deal of structure there. There's a lot of in intermixing. Here is the spatial distance of the scene, so how deep or large the area is. Here you see a bit more of a separation with the preponderance of purple maybe towards the bottom. But then if you organize by whether or not the boundaries of the scene are constrained or not, whether they are open or closed, you can see the division quite strongly. Right? And that is a data-driven way right, of interrogating what the structure of this uh, region's response was. We found no evidence for representing scene category, really, or the individual objects within, within the scene, but strong evidence that it was sensitive to the spatial aspects of the uh, scenes. Okay, um, it's always good to have a comparison area. So here's an early visual cortex ROI. You can see that it does not make the same distinction. Okay, what we want to do is work our way back into the behavior as well. And so here we ran a simple experiment where we arranged a series of matches where participants decided which of two scenes were, was more or less open, right? And then that generates a behavioral ranking for how open uh, or closed the scene is. And then we generate an analogous ranking from our multivariate response in the fMRI. In essence, it is how far to either the left or the right the scene, the scene sits and we can directly correlate the two. Of course, the two correlate very strongly, right? That gives us some more confidence that this um, representation that we're observing in the PPA, not only can we predict it from the neuroanatomy, but it's also relevant for the underlying behavior. And we observe no such relationship, of course, in the early visual, visual cortex. All right. Um, so actually here, I will pause briefly if there are any clarification questions on this first study. I think we're good so far. One thing just to note, at least for me, is that the, your your cursor is trailing behind you like a second or two. So um, oh. okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll try to I'll try to move it in anticipation. Then. Yeah, or just, just slowly and uh, predictably move it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. But there are no questions so far. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So. This is sort of the first example where we can use the, neuro, the neuroanatomy, right, to make a prediction about what the structure of the physiology is going to be. Um, I'll show you another exa ex example of that. Um, this is work that, you know, actually spans several different published, published papers, um, and it's done in collaboration with Ed Silson and Annie Chan, who are now both professors actually in the, in the, U, the UK. Um, we're going to try to use the neuroanatomy in order to address now another mystery in the structure of category selectivity, which is why do these regions come in pairs, right? There's one area that's one area that's say face selective on the ventral surface, and then another one on the lateral surface, right? One for scenes on the ventral, one for scenes on the lateral. And at first glance, right, this this duplication or redundancy, right, is an additional layer of mystery for the sort of standard hierarchical account. So now not only do you have stereotypically located category selectivity, but for some reason there is redundancy where you have two areas that appear to be doing something very similar. 
Um, the suggestion in the in the literature was that maybe these areas are themselves hierarchically organized, right? So that the areas here on the lateral surface are going to do some more basic form of processing, which is then fed into the areas on the ventral surface. I'm going to suggest something slightly different um, that will actually throw a kink into that story as well. So if we look in detail at the neuroanatomy at the lateral surface, we see that the majority of the input coming from retinotopic cortex into the lateral surface in the, in the non-human primate um, is actually coming from areas like V3 and, v, and V4 and V2D. Okay? And these are gonna be the portions of those maps that represent the lower visual field. Right? And they feed in very strongly to the lateral surface, but their connections to the ventral surface are a good deal weaker. Right? On the other hand, the ventral surface gets the majority of its input right from the ventral portions of those same maps, which represent the upper visual field. So I'm going to suggest that the reason that you have paired category selectivity is not so much because they are hierarchically organized, but because they are actually sensitive to the presence of particular categories of stimuli in particular locations in the periphery. Okay, in order to test this, what we're going to do is, uh, again, a lovely sort of high resolution 70 fMRI experiment. We're going to localize um, the two, two areas which are scene selective. On the ventral surface, the PPA that we've talked about already. Over here on the lateral surface is the uh, transverse occipital sulcus or the um, occipital place, place area, if you'd uh, rather. Okay, what we'll do first is a PRF mapping study where we will uh, consider roughly, actually we've now done this with a version that considers 50 million different possible uh, population receptive fields for each voxel. Um, and what we can do is then derive the sort of group receptive field for a particular ROI. And what we see um, is exactly what we predicted. So here in the left PPA, you can see that uh, the overall region's receptive field is going to be concentrated in the contralateral side of space, so in the right, and then in the upper visual field, consistent with its input coming from the ventral portions of the early visual areas. And then for TOS, again, it is contralateral, but now it's the lower visual, visual field. Okay, we can summarize that statistically, right? Both PPA and TOS show a strong contralateral bias. So this is the amount of variance explained in the contralateral versus ipsilateral field. You can see contralateral wins out, but that they have vastly different biases when it comes to upper versus lower, lower field. This is true for both the left hemisphere and the right, right? Where PPA shows a bias for the upper visual field, and then TOS shows a bias for the lower visual field, and those two biases are significantly different from each other. Okay, so, there are additional experiments that we oops, sorry, do beyond this, right, that also verify this using multivariate approaches. Um, and all of this is to say, right, we can anticipate, right, that you're going to have this, this redundant structure because of the nature of the connectivity emerging from the retinotopic cortex. The other thing that it does is it puts a bit of a kink into the hierarchical story because how can these two areas be hierarchically organized Right, if the majority of their representation, where they're, they are the most strongly responsive, are in different parts of the visual world. Right, so within phobia, there's a fair amount of overlap, but as we move into the periphery, the processing almost has to be somewhat in, independent. Okay, so all this is to say that the data that we get out of fMRI is not arbitrary, right? It is deeply related and anticipatable from the underlying neuro, neuroanatomy. And that gives us confidence that what we're looking at, right, is a real signal. And this is a concern that I don't believe anyone currently listening shares, but it is a concern that I'm sure we have all run into in review, which is the general concerns about does fMRI tell you anything, so forth and so on. In fact, when I was a postdoc, I gave a talk at the NIH once, and at the end, a very senior um, monkey physiologist stood up and said, well, why should I care about this if I don't believe in the utility of any of these gross measures? Right? Because he was basically saying that he didn't think that fMRI could tell you anything because of the ambiguities. Um, I think that this convergence helps with that. It also helps us to tie together more closely the physiology and the imaging literatures. And that's going to turn out to be important later on when we start to want to make predictions about behavior. But there are a couple of hurdles that we still have within the domain of fMRI that we're going to have to deal, deal with. 
Um, the first is the standard localization story, um, certainly that dominated the field, the sort of f fMRI field during its early days, um, depended on the interpretation of nulls because you were going to get a map that showed that there was activation or information in some part of the brain, but implicit in the interpretation of that map was that somehow that activation was more important, right, or more present than it was in the areas that did not show up in the thresholded map. But of course, that's artifactual to the threshold. Um, and it's also a very strong interpretation of, of bold signal, right, given that we know that it's rather in, indirect. And so that leads to a sort of conundrum, right, where either we end up in this strange world where we are interpreting nulls in these maps, or we focus in only on particular areas and our theorizing or the implications of our work um, become circumscribed as a, as a result, right? We end up saying things about PPA rather than saying things about scene recognition. Um, oh, and I should mention this because this is a great paper. This is a paper that was done by someone at the NIH where he did 100 hours of flashing checkerboards and showed that pretty much every voxel in the brain eventually responds to alternating flashing checker checkerboards. Okay. Um, the other problem that we're going to have is that um, fMRI data, right, is limited, right, in its temporal resolution and its spatial resolution, though we don't often think think about that, that aspect of it. Um, and as a result, its ability to clarify cognitive theory or to differentiate between different models um, is oftentimes really tricky. There are a couple of counterexamples, and you know, certainly I'll get into a few of them later on in the talk, but I think we do have to acknowledge that, you know, certainly in my sort of longer term arguments now over my career with the more cognitive side of, side of things, that they attempt to kind of differentiate, right, between the level of the neural implementation and the cognitive mechanism. And some of the vagaries of fMRI allow them to do that. Um, moreover, because very rarely do we go from the fMRI data into particular behavioral predictions, right? And so that's going to be a, mot a motivation for the general approach that I'm sort of hawking to you in this uh, talk. Um, I think as a result of this, the field has been moving away right, from testing cognitive theory and moving um, in a bunch of directions that I think really are very fruit fruitful. And in sort of the pre-conversation that I had just before I gave the talk, we got into one of them. Um, but I think the other thing that the field has started to do is to hunt for models that explain variance in the fMRI signal. Um, and that is an interesting enterprise, but one that I think is ultimately rather fraught. Uh, and it happens because of this issue that the structure of those models is definitely wrong, right? They are models of a computational principle, which is what can you do with these sorts of learning algorithms with this sort of structure, but they are not an attempt to really capture the fine-grained structure of the system, um, both because we don't know enough about that structure maybe to accomplish building those models, but also because it's just really difficult. And in a sense, it makes those models even more specific. But without that step, it's unclear what the models are telling us about how the human visual system specifically solves the problem of vision, right? They tell us things about how um, a huge amounts of, of, well, how nonlinear models with a huge amount of potentially learned parameters can pick up on visual structure but the relationship to the human data is gonna be a little bit tenuous. And observing that there is some correlation between the representation you observe in the human data and the representation of the model is interesting to a first approximation, but then you're left with the question, well, what do I do next, right? I'm never explaining all of the variability and the model that I ran is definitely wrong in its structure. So the next model that I'm gonna run is unclear. And there's an infinite possible set of models that I can also get in, get in, into. And so I think we have to be careful, right, um, that we don't sort of throw out all of the utility of the abstraction that comes from the cognitive models and go to these pure, uh, pure approaches of just modeling the brain, right? At the limit, a perfect model of, the, of a person's brain is an exact duplicate of it, but that's not explanatory. Right? You will explain all the variants, but in no way have you actually produced gen generalizable knowledge. Um, we have one question. Um, uh, if, uh, I was pause anyway. Yeah, in those um, 
when the models you're talking about, do you mean uh, deep learning models of visual processing models that, that don't follow the connectivity? Uh, Correct. So I think you you have, and to, to a degree, that's really all models, because I, I think that, you know, as detailed as the neuroanatomy is that I've presented so far, it really is not the complete story. It's also drawn from the monkey rather than from the human. But we do know, right, that the details of the, of the neuroanatomy are going to define the functional response, right? That's the argument that I'm, that I'm trying to make. And in that case, it means that there's some level of that functional response that you're just not going to have access to until you get the right structure. And that's going to just be really tricky, right? And so what I'm going to suggest, right, is that there are other things that we can do right now, right, that are going to help to resolve some of these ambiguities. Did that get at the question? It was my question, but I think it did, yeah. All right, great. Um, OK. So what I'm going to do then is to suggest that um, we take a look at the data that we've actually collected, and we think a little bit about how we're actually using it. So what we typically do in, in sort of, or certainly up until very recently, the, the typical approach was, here's a cognitive model, right? And I, you know, I say working, wor working memory, it has a bunch of sort of sub-components. Sub Those components have been investigated behaviorally. And then we design a paradigm that's sort of fMRI compatible. We port the predictions of the cognitive model, right, into the paradigm. And we look for a contrast, right, that we think is going to give us some information about what's going on. Then we observe some sort of a bold response, right? And we point at some aspect of it, and we give it a name, right? We say working memory, or the visual spatial sketch, sketch pad, or whatever it is. But that is exactly the bit that turns out to be so fraught. I mean, I think, again, it's probably not particularly controversial to say in this room that as we look in detail at the neural substrate, we really don't see structures that appear to function in this way, right? We're not seeing a lot of sort of box and arrow separable modules. Instead, we see broadly distributed patterns of response, particularly as we add power into our experiments. Um, and none of them really cleanly map into the individual boxes and arrows that kind of inspired the the paradigms that we actually ran. So I'm going to suggest that we leave that aside for the moment. And instead, we take the localization that we've gotten out of the fMRI, and we look at what we know about those regions. And so an example that came up in the conversation uh, that I had just, just before I started the talk was, if you localize a process to the entorhinal cortex, that makes it incredibly reasonable to go ahead and look for effects of things like, or representations, that reflect grid, grid cells, because that's a known property of that sub, sub, substrate. And there's a bunch of things, right, that we know at this, at this point about uh, certainly how these visual areas function, right? We know, for example, that many of them are going to have tuning, which is just another way of saying that they're going to have some definition of adjacency that defines their level of response. Um, we know that in that in that space, the responses are going to be more or less monotonic and continuous around some sort of a preferred, right? We know the actual detailed multivariate relationships that we've observed in our experiments. And we know also at the cellular molecular level um, that every single one of these activation events, which uh, is assumedly being reflected in our bold response, is going to have consequences, right, at a cellular molecular synaptic level um, that are going to let us make predictions about um, learning, about the change in behavior over, over time, um, and moreover, about what behaviors are going to be possible or easier than others. And we'll get into that later as well. So what I'm going to suggest is that we go from our cognitive model to the paradigms to the data and from the data the localization of either activation or information we examine what we know about the functional response in detail from that area and we use it in order to shape new paradigms right that are going to test the predictions that come out of these physiological uh, models right so what we're going to do is say can i make a novel right a novel and a precise prediction about what i'm going to observe um, either in further physiological observation or in the case of the things I'm about to show you, people's behavior. And once we've done enough of that, we can work our way back to these abstractions, right, and update them, where now the, the sort of mechanisms, right, 
uh, which and these are totally underspecified because they're kind of the actual arrows, are going to be biologically plausible and hopefully based on known properties of the neural, the neural sub substrate. And the overall organization of the process as well is going to be more reflective of what we see. Okay, but this sort of loop is going to be effortful. It's going to take quite a lot to do, but I think that it can it can be done. Um, and I think there's a lot of good of good examples of the field beginning to do this all already. So I'm going to uh, show you a kind of cute cute one first, and then I'll go through a couple of more de detailed experiments. So um, if you recall, here's the structure of seam representation. So what you've got here uh, in the PPA is closed versus open, and then the relationship to the overall behavior. But you don't have very much of a representation of man-made versus natural. And moreover, we know that the PPA has a uh, strong upper, upper field bias. So this leads to a rather strange prediction, which is that you should be better able to make judgments about how open or closed the scene is in the upper visual field than in the lower whereas there will be no particular difference for man-made versus natural. And when you run the experiment to test that, it's going to turn out to be true. So here we simply have subjects fixate. We then present an, uh, a scene image in the periphery for a very brief period of time to avoid any possibility of eye movements. The scene is then immediately masked. And we look at how accurate people are at making the judgment of open versus closed, man-made versus natural, in the upper minus lower visual field. And you can see for man-made versus natural, there's no particular bias at all. But for open versus closed, you are significantly better in the upper than lower visual field. And the difference between these two is also significant. Right? So this is kind of a toy example of a bizarre behavioral prediction right, that falls directly out of the observed physiology. Okay, I'm going to take you through um, another one. Uh, the co-localization of working memory and perception. Okay, and this is work that was done in collaboration with Suyun Lee and my former graduate student, uh, Chun Wei Ting, who's now in Brad, Brad Postle's lab. So the cognitive model of working memory is sort of relatively familiar. This is a really classic model. This is sort of Badley's. Um, if you then look at the associated neural models, right, they very much replicate the structure where the idea is that perceptual information comes into perceptual areas. It is then transferred into some sort of a frontoparietal circuit where it is maintained. And that is this distinction, right, between the sort of gray areas here versus the blue and the, and the red. Okay. Um, when we actually look, though, in detail at the fMRI data, as I'm sure you already know, there's actually a good deal of evidence that that's not how information is being maintained. Here's one study that um, I did in collaboration with, with Su Yun Lee. Um, here, what, you're, what we're going to do is adapt Frank Tong's task, where you present two stimuli, then you cue them to remember one or the other throughout a delay. We look during the delay for the presence of multivariate information. And then following the delay, in half the runs, they have to do a visual matching task, or they have to do a non-visual match at the level of the category. And then what we're going to do is simply look at where we observe information as a function of whether you are in a visual task or in a non-visual task. And what we see is that here in the posterior cortices, this is an object selective area of the posterior fusiform sulcus versus the lateral prefrontal. Right In the lateral prefrontal, there's information when you're doing the non-visual task, but not when you're doing the visual task. And then the opposite is true right in the posterior areas, despite the fact that this sequence is exactly the same. Okay? What that tells us is that depending on the nature of the information that's being stored, you make use of the circuit, right, which is already uh, specialized for processing that sort of information. Right? It's not that the lateral prefrontal isn't involved at all when you're doing a visual task. Right, In fact, it must be probably because it's engaged in representing task, task demand or things along those lines. But the place where you actually observe the information much more strongly is going to be here in the posterior areas. So that opens up a weird problem because now the perceptual areas, when you're doing a perceptual working memory task, are going to be engaged um, by working memory at the same time that there may be incoming perceptual information, right? And that should create an, an interference effect, right? That is the first order prediction of that physiological observation. There should be direct and bi-directional interference between visual working memory and perception. 
Okay, moreover, so long as you drive responses in these areas, whether or not you are attending to those stimuli, that interference effect is gonna happen. Okay, the effect should be consistent across delays because you're maintaining information in this circuit. So, so long as you're maintaining it there, the interference effect should be present. And we know that these perceptual areas um, have tuning curves within them. And in fact, we know a fair amount about what defines those tuning curves as well. And so the amount of interference that we observe should be predicted by um, the overlap in those putative tuning, tuning curves. So to unpack this last one just a little bit, right? Here's our sort of standard tuning, tuning curve. If we present, right, two stimuli, right? If you're holding in mind one stimulus and then we present another and the two are relatively close together, you're gonna have more inter interference, right? Than if they are not, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and test those predictions now behaviorally. So to begin, let's see whether or not we can recover the, tun the tuning curves in the interaction between visual working memory and ongoing perception. Here's a very simple paradigm where you are uh, given a memory stimulus. You have to remember this, this colored disk. And then you are given an RSVVP task where your job is to report whenever a white letter occurs. Right? And during that RSVP task, completely irrelevant to the task, behind this gray circle where the letters are being presented is going to be another colored disk. Okay? Um, what we do then is systematically manipulate the relationship between the memory cue stimulus right, and this distracting disk, this task-relevant distracting disk in the, back, the background, with the anticipation that we should observe more of an interference effect on your eventual working memory report, the more similar the distractor is to the cue. Okay, and so what I'm gonna plot for you here is the amount of bias and the direction of the um, distracting stimulus as a function of how similar that distracting stimulus is to the item that you're holding in memory. And here you observe for color um, exactly this, this graded relationship that we were predicting. We can run an analogous experiment in orientation and get essentially the exact same result. Okay, so this looks very much like uh, a sort of a graded level of interference, which is commensurate with the known tuning for properties for orientation and color. What we can do is then see whether or not, so this shows that ongoing perception can affect memory. Let's see whether or not memory can directly affect ongoing perception. For that, we have to go to a slightly more complicated task. And so here, Right, you're gonna be given um, a colored Gabor, and then you have to remember either its color or its orientation. After, the, while, after that has been presented, you then have to do a discrimination task where you're presented with two Gabors and you have to say whether they are the same or different on the basis of either their color or their orientation. And following that, you have to do the standard working memory report, okay, for the original stimulus. And what we're gonna manipulate is the difference, is a couple of things. So first we're gonna manipulate the difference between the discrimination stimuli, right, on the dimension that you are making the, the, the comparison. And what we're gonna to expect to see is a standard psychophysical curve where the probability of your reporting different is going to increase as a function of that difference, okay? And what we're gonna look for is a modulation, right, of this threshold value as a function of the relationship between these two stimuli and the item that you're holding in memory, okay? Um, oh, I should also say, because we can, we can arbitrarily do either color orientation memory and either color orientation discrimination, we have two conditions that match, where you are holding something in mind and making a discrimination on the same dimension. And in those cases, we're gonna predict this interference effect between the two but we also have two conditions where there's no, where there's a non-match, where the item that you're holding in memory has nothing to do with the discrimination that you're currently making. And in that case, we don't expect, right, the memory stimulus to have any effect on the discrimination, okay? And so our manipulation of this relationship is gonna be as follows. So either we're going to have our two discrimination stimuli, say here and here, and in the middle condition, the item that you're holding in mind is gonna be directly between the two. 
And what that should do is now draw uh, your representation in the, at the population code level for these two stimuli inward towards itself. That in turn means that the actual distance between them is larger than the perceived distance in that population of cells. On the other hand, if the item you're holding in memory is off to one side of these two stimuli, then it will draw both stimuli towards itself, but we already know that it will have less of an effect on this stimulus than it does on the stimulus that's closer to it. What that means is that the actual distance between them is less than the perceived distance. Okay, so what we're gonna predict then, right, is that, ooh, apologies, that's not coming out exactly well, is that your threshold in the side condition is going to be less than your threshold in the middle condition for saying that the two colors are different, okay? And that's what's gonna be reflected in the um, actual, actual data. This prediction to speed up just a little bit um, holds. So here are the raw psychophysical curves where you see the shift um, in the match condition where the, you are more, uh, you require less evidence in order to say that the two stimuli are different than you do in the middle. Um, and that difference is absent in the non-match non condition. Right, we can go ahead and this is for color. We observe essentially the same result for orientation. We can plot them in summary, right, as now the, the, different, the difference between these thresholds. And what you see here is the crossover interaction that we're looking for. So there is greater interference when you are doing color memory and color discrimination, right? But when you're doing color memory and orientation discrimination, the interference is less and vice versa is true when you're doing orient orientation memory. Okay, so that tells us that there is this bi-directional inter interference and that what you're holding in mind actually changes um, the perceptual content, right? What you actually perceive of, on, of in, in incoming stimuli. Um, this effect is also gonna be uh, persistent across delays. So uh, what we do here is essentially the same experiment, but now rather than a fixed ISI between the memory and the discrimination task, instead we're gonna have a variable one. Um, and under these two views, they make different predictions about what's gonna happen over time. So uh, over time, these recoding accounts say that information is leaving the perceptual cortices and it's ending up in these more specialized systems, which means that the effects and threshold should reduce and extinguish even with enough time. At the same time, the bias introduced in the working memory report should also be extinguished across time. Alternatively, if you're maintaining information in the same system, as is apparent in the physiology, the threshold should reduce but still be present, but the bias should actually increase with time. Um, and that's essentially exactly what we find. Uh, up here is raw data, down here is the difference between the middle and the side conditions. You can see for these three ISIs, 100, 500, and 1,000, over time the threshold, um, the effect in the perceptual threshold diminishes, but it remains significant, while the effect in the bias actually in, increases. Okay, so here what we've done is taken the predictions of the co-localization of these two rather different processes, right? A sort of internally generated and maintained representation in working memory versus incoming perceptual information. But because the fMRI data tells us that they are sharing a neural substrate, we make a very a set of very particular predictions about how that's gonna be reflected in behavior. And those predictions are actually borne out. Okay. We are getting tight on time, but I will quickly go through um, the last section. Uh, just because I think it's sort of interesting data. Um, and so this is going to be testing the consequences, right, of a distributed processing account. So if we take as given that the complexity that we observe in the physiological data, right, the activation of so many different regions across so many different um, apparently separable circuits, right, is reflective of a distributed code, then we can start to make some predictions about how these processes are going to function. Um, and this is going to be work that I did in collaboration with my thesis advisor, Marlene Berman, and with my current collaborator at uh, George Washington University, Steve, Steve Mitron. Okay, so once we start thinking about the brain as an integrated circuit, right, we know that we're going to get activation in a bunch of different circuits. We know, moreover, that the activation in one circuit is not isolated from the activation in the other. So that as we have differences occurring in different parts of the brain, those differences are in turn going to percolate throughout the entire system. 
Because in the end, neurons are relatively simple. If they have enough evidence that they should be firing in the form of depolarizing current, they are going to fire. All right. Um, so here's a very quick demonstration of that interactivity in the context of attention. So this is actually work from my thesis. So imagine you have a simple display where you have a fixation cross and then an object. We're going to cue one part of that object. And according to spatial attention, right, you should end up with a gradient of spatial attention around the queue, such that distance from the queue is going to be predictive of how long it takes for you to detect or identify a target. Okay, but we also know that there's such a thing as object-based attention. And so that means that uh, when you queue a part of an object, you're queuing not just that location in space, but also the object itself. I will propose that because you have queued the object, there's an interaction between object and space-based attention that effectively draws the center of that spatial gradient down, in this case, away from the queue and towards the body of the object. When that happens, these two targets are no longer the same distance away from that center point, okay? In which case you should detect this near object target faster than the far object target. But we can play the game even a little bit further and bring features into it. So let's say that when you queue this location, right, you are having a consequence in circuits that represent space, a consequence in circuits that represent the bounded object, but also a consequence in circuits that represent the features of that object, right? In which case, this queue, when in the presence of a second object, is going to cause a shift, right, from the queued location into the body of the queued object, but then also in the direction of other objects that share features, as it moves towards the fixation cross, once again, these two targets are going to be the same distance away, so there should be less of a difference between them. Okay, then we have a, the case of a non-identical object, right? An object that does not share exactly the same features, in which case there will be less of a shift and more of a difference between these two targets. To make a very longish story of the data short, that prediction holds up pretty much exactly. Here it is holding up for color where you get a larger difference between those exterior targets for the non-identical than identical condition. Also, you get uh, a larger object-based attention effect for the, for the non-identical than for the identical conditions. It works for color, it works for shape, it also works for semantic category. So this is a kind of cute manipulation because in lowercase h is exactly the same as a four, just rotated at 180 degrees. So we can present an uppercase h and either a lowercase h or a four, and we get exactly the same result, okay? That tells us that these, you know, simple spatial queuing paradigms actually reveal something about the nature of distributed processing, right? You're having a consequence across a bunch of circuits at the same time. That consequence extends to the entire scene at once, and the consequences within each one of those circuits have follow-on consequences for the other circuits that are also engaged by the uh, task. Okay. So very, very briefly, and I will do this as a whirlwind because I know we're out of time. Oh, actually, first I should pause for a second. Any clarification questions? And I think you're good, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the other thing that we know, right, is that every single one of these events, and by event here I really mean trials, is going to evoke some distributed pattern of response, and that as a necessary consequence of that response, you are going to have synaptic events which over short and long time time scales are going to reinforce right, the event that just happened. All right, and so what we should be able to see is a domain general mechanism across all of these different levels of the system, right, which reflects that trial by trial learning. But it's gonna be of course very difficult to see in standard data because we never have enough subjects. So this is gonna be a whirlwind tour through um, something that I find really sort of interesting, which is um, the use of big data in the context of behavior. So uh, this is a, a smartphone app. It's a game that you, can, that you can play where you take on the role of a security screener and you're looking for um, dangerous items within bags. Essentially, it's a visual search task. Um, the makers of the game didn't realize it, but they had programmed, in essence, a perfectly orthogonal visual search task because they were randomly generating the bags on every, on every trial. Um, for some odd reason, 15 million different people decided to play this game and have generated now th about 3.7 billion trials of visual search data. Relevant for us, that means that the first N trials of the game have been played by 15 million different people. 
And that's going to allow us to describe with incredible levels of fidelity exactly the reinforcement event that I was predicting before. Right. Um, this is work primarily done by a graduate student um, in Steve Mitroff's lab, Michelle Kramer, and by um, a, post, a postdoc in, in that lab, Patrick Cox. Okay, so what I'm going to do for you here is, in essence, plot for you directly the manifold that relates um, the evidence for an event being likely to occur and your ability to respond to that event. So on the y-axis is going to be your accuracy, right, in this simple object decision task, where you're just going to say, OK, is an object prohibited or not? And what we're going to do is plot that accuracy as a function of what trial number you're on and how many of the trials that you've seen before contained a prohibited item, right? And what you see is exactly what you would expect. So your accuracy increases on prohibited items the more prohibited items you've seen, right? Um, in your past relative to the number of trials that you've actually seen. Okay, you can see that reflected where um, there's a difference in performance significant for different strengths of evidence. If six out of six versus five out of six of the previous trials were prohibited. Um, also for the amount of evidence, right? Five out of five is worse than six out of six. Of course, we can collapse these into a single measure using whatever your favorite statistical method is. Here's a really simple one, the binomial Z. You can also do it for chi-squareds, Bayesian, so forth and so on. All of them work relatively well, though numerically, and in some cases statistically, the binomial Z is actually the best. Um, what you can see then is we convert each one of these data points into a Z-score. And if we take all of those data points and convert them all, we get an almost perfect linear fit. So the optimization of your behavior is almost directly related, right? The optimization of your behavior as a function of your prior experience can be captured by this binomial Z. But this is a really simple task, right? Uh, this isn't even the visual search. This is just, is this one item allowed or not? And it has a stereotypical response as well. What we can do is now look at the visual search data and decompose the, the effect further. And so that's going to allow us to look at um, whether or not we see the same effect at multiple levels of this of this hierarchy, distinct from motor response or, or co cognitive set. Uh, to begin, let's just replicate that this actually happens. It does. This is your hit rate uh, for target present trials as a function of the evidence for target present. Right? You get an inverse relationship in the amount of time it takes you to process the trial as well. All of that works really well. Um, it now replicates across two tasks. We found the same basic function. Um, we can also replicate this in subsets of the data. This is only a million people out of the 15 million. It works for every set that you could possibly want. Um, this is still a big effect of trial type, though. We can decompose that further and look at factors that are orthogonal to trial, to trial type. In fact, factors which are oftentimes considered to be un unattended. So here we're looking at a particular distractor, right? Whether or not these headphones are present or not. Okay, but the presence of headphones is orthogonal to whether there's a target in the bag or not. Um, and that lets us now look for the same learning effect now, not as a function of either say, of sort of motor reinforcement or even the reinforcement of cognitive set. Instead, just as whether or not you have previously had to deal with bags that contain this, this distractor. Um, and we find essentially the same, the same effect. So here is the evidence for there being headphones in the bag, your previous exposure. Here is the increase in your hit rate as a function of that evidence and the decrease in your reaction time. Okay, so this is exactly what we predicted, right? It's a domain general form of learning that we can observe across all levels of the system at the same time. And so very, very rapidly, just in conclusion, I think we'll skip the bit on delay. Um, what we see are these changes, right, that are consistent with this, with this distributed mechanism. Um, if there's time and if people are interested, I can talk a little bit about how that effect varies as a function of the gap between trials and how that uh, effect is really consistent as well with these synaptic mechanisms. Um, but I think there are other takeaways as well. So one is um, this form of learning, right, the reinforcement of the trial of trial experience uh, is actually a source of unwanted variance if you're interested in purely cognitive effects from your behavior. Right, And so what we could do and have started to do actually is to build design matrices for behavioral experiments right, that capture this reinforcement learning at a number of levels, remove 
the variation within individual subjects who are constrained to see one sequence, right? They can't see them all, so their behavior is reflective of their particular sequence of trials, removes that, that variance and in turn cleans up the sort of sensitivity of the behavioral experiments. Um, the other nice thing about it is that once you've separated out that variability, a large amount of the physiological response that we're looking at, right, is also going to be related to that general learning, right? That learning doesn't just happen in isolation. It must also be driven by changes in the underlying physiology that are also likely now contributing to noise, right? So it may be possible to add these, these uh, parameters, right, or these uh, predictors into your into your design matrices for fMRI or EEG experiments or what have you and use them to increase the sensitivity of that as well. Plus you can look at um, what aspects of the physiology do seem to track the trial by trial reinforcement as well. And all that's possible because it's such a stereotypical function. Okay, so what I hope I've done and in conclusion, and I know I've gone a little bit over, but I rarely give one hour talks. Um, I hope that I've made the argument that um, there are inherent ambiguities in fMRI. Those ambiguities, frankly, are true of every, measure, every uh, method that we have for measuring the underlying physiology. We are constrained to be taking low dimensional cuts through you know, a really almost infinitely dimensional thing. Um, and in so doing, we end up uh, biased or at the very least drawn towards um, interpretations and, and uh, conundrums that are difficult to solve within any one method. And so the trick is really going to be, as we all know, convergence. We have to find ways of making predictions across these different methods. And moreover, we want to be using the observations from one method, be that physiology, um, single unit recording, fMRI, EEG, or behavior, in order to make novel and interesting predictions in the other domain. And in so doing, we can begin to kind of cycle back around to these abstractions that were motivating us to begin with and refine them so that we have still general abstract ideas about how these things are working, but that are really grounded in the biology rather than in our intuition from uh, our phenomenology. And I think I will stop there. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, yes, we have a um, question from Pedro, who I'll um, invite to the screen. Uh, usually it takes a few seconds. So, uh, you, should I stop sharing the screen just so I can? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, there you go. And uh, if you need to go back to the slides, to, um, you can go back. And there's some uh, clapping going on in the chat, uh, which is uh, oh, yeah. oh, that's yeah, the um, really that's fabulous because <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> the, the new way of uh, <laughs> showing appreciation. Um, right, so Pedro is not coming for some reason. So I'll ask the question for him. Um, so uh, the question is, any eye tracker were used in the first experiments that you showed us to see if the person had analyzed differences, uh, different parts of the image in different image, co image contexts uh, in order to analyze if they have seen uh, in the same way all the images? Ah, so in the fMRI experiments for the scenes, as I assume what we're talking about, um, there the presentation times are really brief. So they're 500 milli milliseconds. So there's not really enough time for them to be doing too much of this particular movement. Um, I would say that in other studies where we have looked at this, uh, yes, particularly if you draw people's attention to different parts of the scene, you will get vastly different hysteresis effects on later trials for that scene. So even if you, for example, draw people's attention to aspects of the scene and they make a judgment about that scene, um, depending on what aspects you draw their attention to, their judgments are vastly different in their efficiency. So you know, you ask someone, is the scene open or closed, but you move their eyes away from the sort of horizon line, um, they get slower, right? So I think definitely there's going to be an impact of that in the physiology as well. I think here what we were trying to do is just sort of get at the baseline response of will drive activation initially, not really give them enough time to make a series of planned eye movements, and just see what that sort of early default response in PPA is. 
But absolutely, as people are fixating throughout this scene, the attention results, right, that I showed you a little bit later, tells you that the learning consequences of those fixations are going to be different for different fixations, but also the distribution of attention and therefore the efficiency of behavior is going to be um, also affected. And so I would expect that you will find context effects wherever you go to look for them, certainly with enough power. I will just for a quick second digress and say, the nice thing about the, the large data set, well, one is we're, we put it in a database so that hopefully soon everyone can get to it and play around. The other thing that it does is it emphasizes the difficulty of null results. So in behavior, um, with enough power, any two different things really will show some difference in reaction time or accuracy, right? Because we can get error bars that are effectively a tenth of a millisecond, right? And so you have to live with those effects. And so a lot of the, the theoretical distinctions that exist in the behavior between there being an effect in one condition and not in the other are actually more of a quantitative difference than a qualitative one. Yeah. Right. And so there was a little bit of an implicit reasoning from that null that sometimes happened with enough data that falls away completely. Right. And as a thought experiment, you can see why that is. Right. Two different images produce a different response of the retina. That different response carries through LGN, carries through V1. And then there's a series of nonlinear filters to get to the motor response. But it was still different to begin with. Right. Yeah. So with enough power, I'm pretty confident at this point, any two different images will differentially drive response. Right. A bit. And that means you have to think carefully about design and about the interpretation of the null. Is that something that you guys are, are trying to follow, like this um, mass data um, approach, or like to build apps that manage to, um, to capture the questions that you want to ask? That so, I, so that, yes, I think that you know the, the airport scanner data set's great, and that it lets you, because it's so big, dive deeply into some aspects of it right that are very likely to be general so the general reinforcement the reason we went after it in particular is that that's likely to generalize across tasks as well but the underlying logic here is that there's going to be context effects everywhere and so as you move between different tasks even different apps right played in different contexts you will get differences and so i think eventually we're going to need multiple data sets that let us, one, test whether things are general, but then also let us, in a data-driven way, figure out what is general and what is not. Um, and so that's the direction that we want to go in. In practice, people don't like playing, uh, playing psychology experiments um, to the degree that 15 million people will voluntarily download this. Okay. So what, what we're really going to have to do, most likely, is go to the people that make these things and say, look, if you log your data in a certain way, and if you design the back of your experiment in a way that is randomized, where there are separable events and where factors can be held orthogonal, then we can really use that to inform science. And some of those things exist. You just have to kind of get through the gate. Yeah. Uh, but it's very hard to design. We've tried to design occasionally psych tasks that will be generally interesting, but the developers of the apps just laugh at us. Like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You need many more flashing things. You need. They're like, no, we want visual control. They're like, no, they will not play this. They will play two two trials of this and throw it away. Um, cool. So we have another question uh, from Tim, uh, and I'll ask it for him. Um, um, so yeah, awesome data. Uh, what's the difference between the loop which you are describing and the loop in the deep net models? where, for example, we show that humans uh, fail at uh, adversarial examples. So is, that, isn't this a similar thing, but a yes. uh, different exactly. scales of representation? Uh, I wasn't sure what was really different about the approach you were criticizing. So I think if you're using the deep models to say, OK, here's this computational principle. Here's the nature of the visual world. Applying this principle to the nature of the visual world, we get certain patterns of sort of odd errors. Some of those patterns of errors match the human, some of them do not. And that's interesting, right? That's a behavioral prediction falling out of this computational model that lets you find convergence and lets you do work. So I think that is an example of the, of the loop. Where I think we run into trouble is if we say, well, here's my multivariate fMRI response. And here's my seven layer you know, deep, deep, deep belief net. And here's a correlation between layer this and this. 
and I don't know what to do with that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not exactly providing explanatory prediction, right? You're not really explaining the structure of the fMRI data, and it's not clear what the prediction that falls out of that immediately is. I think that so long as you are making those predictions, it's a perfect example of the loop. So I don't think that the, the loop is like my new idea. In fact, you know, in the conversation that I had before this, Tim, definitely you're doing it. Yeah. Right? So I think it's what I'm trying to do is, is emphasize that that's the way forward. I think a lot of people are doing it. And I'm trying to give you examples in behavior, which is a little bit rarer. Cool. Um, I, I, I had a um, much uh, lower level question. Um, uh, so when talking about um, sharing the data about the open versus closed, which uh, uh, also corresponds to um, upper visual field. I was wondering if that's um, if there's a chicken and egg there, because because usually, unless I'm, I'm I'm getting this wrong, usually um, the 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 part of the visual field where you'll uh, where you'll notice whether things are open or closed are oh sure yeah so this is. So again, that chicken and egg problem, right, is fundamental to how the representation is built. Yeah. So it's not, the prediction is squirrely because you wouldn't have made it without the physiology data. But as you sit with it for a second, right, it makes sense. Why does PPA pick up on the open close distinction really well? One is that in the lower visual field, it's concerned with navigability and that's its interconnections with the hippocampus, with the rhinal cortices, right? On the other hand, there's also a good deal of information in the upper visual field about the openness of a, of a, of a scene. Um, and so I think what you end up with, right, is not that, exactly the argument I'm trying to make is that the representation is not arbitrary, yeah. right? It is systematically related to the underlying visual statistics of the world because that's what built it. Right? It didn't just fall out of the sky, like here's a module that does open versus closed, and by happenstance, I'm gonna put it on the ventral surface. Yeah. Right? It's like, no, here's a distinction that you need to make to navigate, and lo and behold, here's an area that's well suited to make that distinction, and it does. And that distinction is reflected in its response. It's reflected in the structure of the behavioral response relative to this area, right? So that area provides a constraint that affects the overall behavior but none of them are arbitrarily related, right? They are all related to some combination of the neuroanatomy, the nature of the visual statistic, and the task demand that's making you care about that statistic at all. Yeah. Um, cool, I think we're out of time, but that was um, really, really interesting. And, um, and thanks again um, for joining today and for, for talking. Um, and I hope everybody enjoyed this as much as I did, yeah. Thank you very much for having me, and thanks, everybody, for coming. All right. Cheers. <laughs> thanks a lot. All right, bye.